All right, good evening this evening. Oh, see, I know already how you're feeling. In the United States, that's called tired. The Bible says much studies weariness to the flesh. So is much preaching. It's like, how long will he be tonight? I don't know, too long, right? So thank you so much for your kindness and how hospitable you've been, but not only that, for lending me your ear and your seats while you've been here uh, this week and coming and listening to the preaching. I want to maybe change directions just a little bit tonight to give you something maybe that might be a little bit more personal. Mark chapter number five, if you would like to follow along, would you like to stand for just a minute and kind of just sort of wake up just a tad and Try your best to uh, get some ammonia capsules and put them up your nose and sort of get your eyes open. I'm very much aware that you're tired. If you go to sleep, it's perfectly okay with me. I promise that we'll still be going when you wake up. (laughs) But it's much easier for me to stay awake. That's why they have me preaching, because otherwise I'd probably be sleeping also. You know, in life sometimes we recognize that even in the Christian life, things come that are unexpected difficulties, problems, and troubles. It's not always something that we have planned for, even though we like to think that we're ready for it. And then sometimes some of those troubles last for a very long time. They don't go away overnight. I don't know how many of you have had a problem like that where you've prayed for years and years and years, not just for something that happens to be about a loved one or someone else, but about a personal problem. Something that burdens you. Not just a besetting sin, but a a difficulty, a problem. In the story we're going to read about here in just a moment, it's a woman that has an issue of blood. And can I say this about her at the onset so that you'll not get a misconception? The Lord puts this stuff in the Bible for several reasons. And one of the things you've got to recognize is this woman is nameless in the passage, not because she doesn't matter but because the Lord chooses by the way that He writes, it's called anonymity, is in order to tell the story, He tells it in such a fashion that you could pin your name into the passage and say, I know what it's like to be where she is. Twelve long years, this woman has had the same issue. And the reason I draw it to your attention before I read the text and we pray is simply because it's a very private thing that was happening in her life. You might even be able to say this about the text. She looked okay on the outside, but she was messed up on the inside. She was bleeding profusely. Her life's energy was being drained out of her on a daily basis. She woke up with it. She went to bed with it. The next day, nothing had changed. Look, if you will, please, let me just give you this in the passage here. Notice in verse number 25, a certain woman which had an issue of blood twelve years and had suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was nothing bettered but yet but grew rather grew worse. And when she had heard Jesus came in the press behind and touched his garment, for she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. Brother Sam, you pray. Would you ask the Lord to help us? Thank you. You can be seated. Let me see if you'll allow me just a little bit of time. If you've been here the last couple of nights, or maybe you might have heard me preach once or twice, you know when I say a little bit of time, before I actually get to the text text, we have the pretext. And so we have to talk about how we got to where we got to. This is one of the classics in all of the Bible. Next to the prodigal son, you have every kind of thing you can imagine going on in the passage. The Lord's a professor because you're going to see him demonstrate power over the elements in a storm here in just a minute. And then you wind up realizing he's a pretty good psychiatrist. He deals with a devil-possessed man. And then you realize he's a great physician because he winds up dealing with a woman who has an issue of blood. Y'all were wondering what issue. All women have different issues. And then he's also a great pediatrician if you're looking for four Ps because he takes care of a little girl at the very end of the passage. And all that is found in the beginning at the end of Mark chapter 4 and at the beginning of Mark chapter number 5. I want you to take your look at your attention there for just a moment. The last few verses of chapter 4, you notice the apostles are with Jesus in a storm. 
and he's beginning to sail over to wherever they're headed and a storm comes up. Jesus is physically exhausted and he's tired and the Bible said that he's asleep on the back of the boat there and the boat is being filled up with water. That must have been the first waterbed, I guess, in the Bible. Must be. And so, that's funny. Waterbed in the Bible, boat full of water. Okay. At any rate, that's about as good as it gets right there. My wife says this to me on a regular basis, honey. If you have to explain the joke, it's not funny. I said, yeah, but honey, when I tell the joke again, they get it and they laugh. She said, no, that's a pity laugh. So I'll do my best not to waste your time by explaining the joke. But here, let me say this to you. The Lord's back there asleep, and the apostles come, and you know what they say to him? Lord, care us not that we perish. Notice that in that passage, those apostles are only worried about the storm they're in. They don't recognize that the storm they are in is not about them and it's not even for them. The storm they're in is to take them somewhere else. Oftentimes in your life, your storms you're going through are for someone else's benefit. It has nothing to do with you at all. The Lord is utilizing a storm much like He did with the Apostle Paul when He used the Euryclidon over there in uh, Acts chapter number 27 and 28 and pushes Him over to the place of Melita there so that an entire village could be taken care of and things could be handled. You say, why? Oftentimes the Lord will use a storm to take you to a place that you would not normally go on your own. It's off course. It's out of balance. It's something that happened that's unique. It's something that took place and transpired that wasn't in your normal routine. I don't know about you. I like routines. I was raised around routine. Paramilitary background, 19 years old. I'm a policeman and being told what to do, when to do it, how to do it, how to dress, what to do, how to act, laws, rules, general orders, SOPs, all those other kind of things. I like structure. And then all of a sudden, something comes at you that breaks that routine and it kind of gets you out of your comfort zone. It's like, I don't really have a plan for this one. And storms come up un unexplained and unexpected. And guess what? Jesus is in the boat. Everything must be fine. Saved. Glory to God. Praise the Lord. Going to heaven. Don't expect storm. Go into the doctor's office. Doctor comes out and mentions the C word to you. Oh, wait a minute. I wasn't planning on that. Hold on, Lord, I, 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 I don't have time to deal with cancer. I got kids, I got grandkids, I got problems and difficulties to solve my own. Lord, I, I can't pull over. Lord, so nope, you got to have cancer for a while. And Are you going to survive? Don't know. Can't tell. Where's the storm going to take you? Don't really know what's going to happen. Lord, didn't plan on the divorce. Didn't plan on the financial ruin. Lord, didn't plan on going bankrupt. And the Lord all of a sudden takes that. And guess what happens? They're in that storm. The Lord gets a little frustrated with them. I'm sure that He does. He's certainly gotten frustrated with me. Because the first thing He says to them is, where is your faith? I, I don't know, but it's difficult sometimes in storms to trust that the Lord, you know, that's when the people throw that verse in the Bible at you, Romans 8, 28. You know, everybody knows that verse. That's the verse that people say to you when they don't know what else to say to you. And they say it to you and you want to think, you know, that may be scripture, but it makes me want to punch you in the face right now. <laughs> you know, well, don't worry, brother. All things work together for good to them that love God and that are called according to his purpose. And then they walk off into the wild blue yonder and you're like, why would you have to say that? But at any rate, guess what happens? They wind up in a bad storm and unbeknownst to them, maybe perched like a gargoyle up there in those mountaintops, there's a, a naked man up there, devil-possessed man. He's sitting there looking down there over that storm. He's watched a lot of ships and storms and has watched those drowned men's bodies wash up on the beach where he is. Nobody wants to come to talk to him. He's devil possessed. He doesn't fit in. He's got hair like a wild maniac and he's been cutting himself and screaming. They put him in fetters and chains before. He might even be an escape prisoner. He might be a jailbird. You can't tell. And he's up there and he's walking among the tombs of all places. Hanging out in a graveyard in the nighttime. And he's watching that storm out there. And as that storm begins to crash, the thunder crashes and the lightning flashes out there across there. And he hears the screams of those men. And then all of a sudden he hears something he's never heard before. For above all of that uproar of that storm, he hears a man stand up on the bow of that boat up there and he says to the elements, peace, be still. And boy, just like you take a little bitty baby and put it in those satin sheets and tuck that little baby in and that little baby takes one big breath and 
just sort of relaxes and settles down. That calm sea begins to go out there and all of a sudden it's just as smooth as glass and the chandeliers of heaven begin to get turned on and the twinkle, twinkle little star comes out and the moon begins to glow and glistens, boy, and lights a pathway right over there to where that devil-possessed man sits there perched up there on the top of that mountaintop there looking out over that thing. And I've wondered to myself if maybe that man wasn't sitting there thinking, boy, I sure wish he could do in here what he just did right there. You say, why? Because sometimes there's greater pain going on between your ears than there is physical pain. And it's hurtful, and it's difficult, and nobody seems to understand it. Everybody has a remedy for it, and everybody thinks they knows the answer for it. But guess what happens? It doesn't help you at all, and you know what? You still feel like you're running around among the tombs. Well, all of a sudden, Peter, I think, I mean, the way I tell the story, I'm going to get to my text in a little while, but just give me a moment if you could. Uh, I think Peter probably comes to himself. He was the captain of a fleet, a fishing fleet before, and he probably starts recognizing during the storm they've been blown off course, and he takes out his phone and talks to Siri, or he talks to whoever it is, Bixby or somebody like that, and, you know, and he says, hey, you know, where are we? And the Lord said, I keep telling you, put that cotton-picking telephone down and, and that kind of a thing. Why are you always dealing with that? Well, Lord, you know, I don't know if you've seen the latest uh, Twitter feed here. And I don't know if you've seen the latest Facebook. You know, you're trending right now, Lord, and, and that kind of thing. Yeah, I'm trying to get a nap, and you're worried about the... At any rate, he figures out that they're off course. And then all of a sudden, you know what he recognizes? He recognizes, uh, Lord, uh, do you know where we're headed? Uh, we're headed to Gadarene. Uh, you know who's on Gadarene? A devil-possessed man is on Gadarene. And, and the Lord's like, yeah. Just like the woman at the well, I must needs go by. You know why? I've got an appointment over there. You, she, he goes by to see somebody you and I wouldn't want to be seen with. And so the Lord starts heading over in that direction, that kind of a thing. And Peter's like, Lord, I don't really know. Boy, that moonlight has just lit up a pathway, almost as if that boat's staying there. It's so quiet now that w that water looks like a mirror. It's just glistening out there like diamonds floating. And he begins to come up there, and the bottom of that boat begins to scratch up against that old rocky shore. And the Lord steps out into that water, and he begins to walk up there. And here comes that man out of that mountaintop up there, and he begins to run through the bushes, man, and he's running here. <laughs> If I could paint, I'd have the apostles starting to get back out. And then they see that man coming and I have him starting to get back in <laughs> and kind of backing off. Lord, you better come on out here now. We need to shove off. We need to get out of here, man. Here comes that crazy man. Yeah. And the Lord just stands his ground and he doesn't do anything. Maybe he even begins to walk toward that man. That man's as devil possessed. Now you got to understand the picture here. You got to grab it. Your Bible's very graphic. That Bible that says that the man's naked. It's not natural for you to embrace a naked man running at you, wild, bloody, had been cutting himself and screaming and hollering, been living in the bushes among the tombs. You can imagine how wild that must be. A maniac, the Bible calls him, of Gadara, crazy man. And the Lord stands there unmoved by what he's seeing. And the man comes, isn't it, isn't it interesting what the Lord will run to that we run away from? Isn't it interesting that in your condition, whatever it might be, that the Lord stands His ground? He's not upset no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter what marks you bear in your body, no matter what sin's done to you, no matter how bad it's gotten, no matter how rotten your past is, no matter how wicked and ungodly you are. You're not shocking Jesus. You know what He says? Come here, you got a problem. <laughs> He doesn't run away from you. He doesn't say, get cleaned up, get some clothes on, get your hair cut, get fixed up, get uh, presentable, because I'm wondering about somebody tapping a picture there, Pavarazzi watching me while I'm talking to you. I mean, how would that be if they put something on the post and, and make me look like I talked to the likes of you? I mean, what would the world say? He don't worry about that. He's trying to help somebody. And he sees that guy coming to him and, and he stops there and the apostles are saying, Lord, you better come with us. You better come with us. You better come with us. And, and they're over there in the boat and the Lord stands there. You know, it's an odd thing to me. An odd picture there. When that man runs down there, he's face to face there with the Lord. I can imagine how his breath must have smelled like sulfur or something. And all those demons crawling all over him and the Lord being able to see that in him and he's standing there unshaken and unmoved and all there. I mean, just like a granite stone wall just, just standing there looking at him. And he asked him a strange question. Now he's God. I believe Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh, right? I'm not one of these mono gods that say, oh, he's one and he's another one. He's a, no, it's God manifest in the flesh, right? And so he stands there right there. If he is, he's omniscient. He knows everything, right? Okay. You know what he says to him? He says, what's your name? 
well, doesn't he know who he is? <laughs> well, he knows every demon that's crawling in the guy. But you know what he's trying to do is he's trying to say, hey, let me ask you something, Legion. Do you know about you what I know about you? I like the straightforwardness of the Lord. I like the fact that He calls you out right off a of jump street. He doesn't play any games. He's right straight to the point. What's your name? Jacob. What does that mean, Jacob? Uh, Sir Planner. Liar. Thief. Cheater. I, good, we're getting somewhere. I think I'm going to change your name now. Adam, we talked about it the other day. Where are you? I'm over here hiding in the bushes. Uh, let me ask you a question. What's your name? Legion. Why? Oftentimes the Lord wants to know. Well, there's a lot in a name. But I also like the fact that he's personal. He cares about the individual. Amen. He doesn't give any time of day to the demons. He doesn't say, you know, I want to know all their names and stuff. My name's Legion for where many. <laughs> and the Lord said, I got something for you. I'm going to make deviled ham out of you. Or <laughs> that would be suicide in the Bible. Su su suicide. Pigs. I hear my wife right now saying, I told you, but it's so tempting. At any rate, you know what happens? That Bible says that he deals with that guy and nobody else would ever deal with him. Nobody could help him. Nobody could do anything for him. Do you realize sometimes there are certain things that you're in, not just storms in your life, but problems that only the Lord can handle? And you have to be willing to admit you've got a problem. You know the hardest thing to get people to do nowadays? To say, I've got a problem. What's your name? You put your name in the blank right there. The man's name is Legion, but it's somebody else's name. He's identified by his problem. You know what the woman in the story is identified? She's identified by her sickness. You know how people identify other people? By how they act. That's why if you're called Christian, you're supposed to be acting like your father, Jesus Christ. You're supposed to be known by how you act. And so all of a sudden he says, what's your name? My name's Legion, for we're many. And the devils come out there and they say, man, don't kill it. Don't send us out there into the abyss and don't do this and don't do that. And the Lord sees a bunch of pigs over there, Jews raising pigs, insanity. But anyway, he sees a bunch of pigs over there and he said, put us in the pigs. He said, okay. And those pigs run down, hell, uh, down the hill there and then jump off into the sea there. And then know what you see? The next thing you see is that man clothed and in his right man sitting at the feet of Jesus. Now, for me, you talk about two different kinds of storms. One storm was in the elements. The other one was a psychological storm. You never know what's in somebody's uh, backpack. I had an old preacher tell me one time, he was preaching to a bunch of people, and uh, he did just a, just a gracious old man, the way he handled it and took care of that. I was enamored by how he talks, like talking to a grandfather or something. And I said, man, what do, you, what do you do? What are you thinking in your mind when you're presenting the gospel in such a fashion that it, it, it's, it's so enamoring that way? And he said, well, you never know what's in their saddlebags. And I said, what do you mean? He said, I'm looking at people I don't know. And he said, they're out there and they got all kind of problems in their life. Maybe they're thinking about suicide. He said, maybe they're going through a divorce. Maybe they got a bad disease. He said, maybe they got financial trouble. He said, maybe they come from an abused family. Maybe they were abused when they were a child. Maybe they were orphaned. Maybe nobody. He said, you never know what's in their saddlebags. I took a lesson from that. I thought, you know something? I've been guilty of thinking everybody has had the life I've had. Because we generally identify people by where we are. We think, oh, everybody was raised the same way I was raised. Guess what I found out? Everybody's not raised the same way I was raised. I take a look sometimes and I realize that many people run by because we look at all the great things that a man named Elijah did in the Bible. But you know what's a strange thing? That man was at the end of his rope and was sitting there and he said to know the Lord, it is enough, Lord, just let me die. Don't get all caught up in the fact that he said, you know, well, Lord, you know, I'm the only one that hasn't bowed the knee to Baal. And the Lord said there's, there's yet but 7,000. You ought to be careful because before you even get to that passage, and might I say this in his defense, if there was all the 7,000 that were there, why didn't they open their mouth when he was up on the mountain? Not a single one of them said, Amen, preacher, we're with you. We'll help you, preacher. I'm behind you, preacher. Amen, preacher, that's a good thing. I mean, they kept their stinking mouth shut while he's up there standing all by himself. He finished the task he was supposed to do. They didn't help him slay all the, the prophets over there and turn the Jezebel's the prophets into a non-profit organization. They didn't help him at all. Oh, praise the Lord, you laughed at one of them. Oh, man. One out of four ain't bad, man. That's pretty good. I'll take those odds. That's great. 
25% of the time they laughed, you know. <laughs> but, but listen to me. You know what's a strange thing? The Lord deals with that man, and instead of rebuking him, instead of beating him down, instead of uh, making fun of him, you know what he does? He comes down there with him, probably takes his coat off, and you know what he does? He hands him his coat. He builds him a fire. He makes some bread, probably biscuits. He's a southern kind of a god, that kind of thing. And he puts him some cold water down there. You say, why? He's dehydrated. Do you realize how crazy people act when they get dehydrated? Yeah. You realize how nuts people are when they get dehydrated? You say, what happens? You can get spiritually dehydrated and you can act out of character and not know which way is up and all that. You're saved, born again, blood washed, going to heaven. And the next thing you know, you're off the track. You're out in the, in the far country somewhere doing the crazy stuff you never thought you'd be doing. You say, what's the problem? You're thirsty. You need a drink. And I don't mean liquor. I mean, you need a drink of the cool water from the real spring. You need to get back to Jesus Christ. There's an elderly lady back home, and uh, she was in her 80s. This has been a bajillion years ago, a little shotgun house. A uh, rescue found her out there. We had to kick the door down to go in there and get her. Found her laying there on the floor. Uh, newspapers all over the place and mail all over the creation. And she's laying down there. They picked her up and put her on the gurney. And she's, man, I mean, you've never heard such foul language in all your life. I mean, cussing and swearing, calling names and kicking so bad, they put her in leather straps just to transport her. Wrapped her up like a mummy. She looked like an Egyptian mummy, you know. She wasn't quite pressed for time, but she was Egyptian mummy, man. And they brought her in there and, and they put her in there. And when I walked in, there's all of these nurses and policemen that are in there. I mean, all these nurses and rescue people, they're all in white. I'm the only guy in blue. Guess who got picked on? I walked in the door. I could hear her screaming. Then I go back there and the charge nurse goes, back in the back, you know. And I said, okay. I said, well, I'm not taking her. Y'all got her, you keep her, you know, that kind of a thing. <laughs> the jail's not the place for her. Well, you got to go back there. We got back there in the back, man, and all of a sudden she focused on me and locked in on me. And, man, I'm going to tell you what. I mean, she wore me up one side and down the other. And I said to the doctor, what do you need me here for? He said, we need a witness. I said, uh, well, you got all these people in here that are a witness. She says, yeah, but she thinks that we're all trying to hurt her and we're just trying to help her. Her perception, because later on you're going to find out in the story she was dehydrated, was that everybody was trying to help her, was trying to hurt her. Her perception was messed up. Right. Do you ever realize that sometimes when you get a persecution complex that the problem might be you're dehydrated? And the reason that you can't do anything but complain and gripe and point at other people and talk about all the bad things other people do. Now, I'm sure you people here in Australia, you probably don't do that unless you're people. <laughs> if you're aliens, maybe you don't do that. But if you're people, people can get under your skin. Right? A little bit? Y'all are like, oh, not us. No, no. We just love people. I think the world would be a great place if it wasn't for people. Sometimes. People cause wars. Well, the bottom line is, as the doctor said, I think we know what's wrong with her. They gave her some happy juice and things like that. She began to settle down. They ran two bags of saline solution in her. And all of a sudden, she starts looking around the room. And she doesn't even recognize where she's at. And she realizes it all of a sudden. And she looks down at the restraints and things like that. And she said, oh, my Lord. Oh, my Lord. Oh, my Lord. What have I done? And then she looked at me. And I'm like, oh, man, why? She goes, come here, young man. I walked over there. I said, yes, ma'am. She said, what have I done? And I said, well, we found you. Have you been a while since you had something to drink or anything like that? Well, she says, uh, my son-in-law is supposed to come over and fix the pump. And I ain't been no water in a while. And so, yeah, I reckon it's been a few days since I had something to drink. Well, what did I do? And I said, well, ma'am, you, you passed out there on the floor and stuff like that. She said, yeah, but why is all these people here and I got these things on me? And I said, well, ma'am, you were um, pretty, uh, pretty upset. And I said, you're cursing and swearing and all that. Man, she turned bleat red. She said, young man, you go get everybody that has heard me and bring them in here. And one at a time, I brought those people in there. She said, I'm a Christian, and I don't know why I talked that way and why I did what I did. And I want to tell you I'm very, very sorry, and I hope and pray that you'll forgive me. And uh, I don't normally act that way and stuff like that. And I took that through that whole deal. You know what the doctor said? The problem was that she was just dehydrated. 
You know, sometimes mental illness can be created because you just need a drink. You know what you find by Elijah's head? The first thing you see in the passage over there in 1 Kings chapter number 19, you know what's laying right there by his head? A cruise of water. You say, why? Even preachers get thirsty. You get tired. You need to be refreshed. There's nothing like a cool drink of water on a hot day. Well, we've got to get back to our story here. The devil-possessed man sitting there clothed in his right mind. He wasn't go to the fundamentalist store and find out how he was supposed to dress. And because he's, you know, he wasn't a Calvinist, well, if you really are saved and you really did do right, then you're going to dress right, you're going to look right, you're going to read your Bible, and you're going to pray, and you're going to do that. He just met Jesus. Amen. And when he ran into Jesus, he just felt like, you know what, to be in his presence, I need to kind of change how I'm acting, clean his act up a little bit. But let me just tell you, underneath his clothes, and he still had scars. Underneath the clothing, he still had broken heartedness. Underneath the clothing, he still had all the repercussions and everything. You see, even though he met Jesus and life from that point changed, the things that happened in the back, the repercussions that transpired, he still had to go back and face those things. But at least he started off in a good way. And the Lord comes out and he's finished with that and he's so far blown off the course that he has to catch another ship and he gets on that other ship and he runs into a very well-known man there, Jarius. He's a well-known person in the temple and Jarius, you know, all of a sudden kicks aside all that religiousness and, and all of who he is and the political hierarchy and that kind of a deal because his daughter's sick. You'd be surprised when your kid gets sick how quick religion goes out the window. You need a relationship. <laughs> You'd be surprised how quick you are to not be ashamed to pray, not be ashamed to call on whoever can give you some help. You say, why? Somebody I love, somebody I care about, somebody that can't help themselves. They're in a bad way. Can you do something for me? And you know what Jerry says? I don't care what all these people are doing. I don't care about the hierarchy. I don't care if they want to crucify you. I don't care if they don't like you. My daughter's sick and I need supernatural intervention. I mean, I think that man's got a bad backbone like a saw log. For him to be able to do that, I wish politicians nowadays would do that. I wish politicians had enough courage to say, I want to give glory to my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for getting me to where I'm at because if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be here. I can trust a man like that. But a guy like that that's a Christian to get the votes and then you never hear from him ever again, I don't trust those people. I think they're unusual individual. Not Jarius. Jarius comes up there and said, hey, hey, listen, Lord, I got a problem here. I need you to do something for him. What's that? My daughter's sick. She's 12 years old, and she's been sick for a little while. I need you to do something with her. And the Lord said, okay, good. I'll come by your house. And they come, and everybody's coming to go watch the show. They're going to a sheep show, and they're going to go watch what's happening there. And along the way here, here's this woman. Now we're coming to our text. This woman in the Bible, the Bible says that she's been sick for 12 years and she sought many physicians and spent all that she had. She's an industrious woman. At some point, she had money somewhere. At some point, she had worked somewhere. She had enough money. What she did have, she at least tried to do something to help herself and at least she had spent the money. But guess what? She was no better. She was worse. She probably tried every holistic treatment in the world. She probably tried baking soda and bleach or whatever else it might be. She probably threw stuff over her shoulder, stood up on her head. She did whatever they told her to do, a little eye of bat and wing of newt and that kind of a thing and some kind of a witch's potion. I'm all for the natural stuff that works. You know, you get desperate, you'll try just about anything. I mean, when you're tired of being sick and sick and tired of being sick and tired, you know what you're doing? You go to WebMD and diagnose yourself, and man, you'll just about be ready to jump off the Tallahatchie Bridge if you think it'll make you better. <laughs> Come on, can I get a witness? Yeah. You are. It's kind of like, you know, well, they just told me if I walk around out in the grass barefooted, you know, I get grounded, and, and I, I mean, I'm going to be good. That's great unless your back, backyard's full of cactus. <laughs> That's not a good thing, man. It's kind of like, well, you know, now I'm pulling all these little thorns out of my feet and everything, and I, I can't walk anymore. But, but the Bible said, you know what? She tried. She made an effort. Can I say this to you? Everybody in the town knew her by her disease. It was a filthy disease. Every person she was, she was unclean. Now, I'm not trying to belittle, make fun. That's the Jewish law. The Jewish law was is that wherever she was, it had to be cleaned, it had to be purified, and that it had to be pronounced clean by the priest. As a matter of fact, if she went out into public and she touched somebody, that person had to go be cleaned, and they actually could have stoned her if they wanted to because she's spreading a disease, kind of like COVID. 
right? Isn't that strange? I mean, back in the United States of America, you probably weren't aware of this. We had a fellow that came in, and he was a Muslim and that kind of thing. And they said, you know, well, when he comes in, he's going to make everybody wear a burqa. And, and that, that might not have been too bad of an idea. <laughs> Nowadays, they don't have, Anyway, but at any rate, they were going to do that, and you were going to have to have a, a covering and all that other kind of stuff. <laughs> and it never happened. And then a guy came in that was exactly the opposite and who claimed for freedom and this and that and the other, and everybody wound up wearing a mask and covering their face. <laughs> Kept me from coming over here a couple years ago. But let me just say this to you. You know what happened? Everybody in the town knew she's that woman. She's got that. Probably, you know, she's a sinner. That's probably what she is. She, you know what? She's reaping what she sowed. She's, she's, she's one of those, she's one of them dirty people, one of them filthy people, one of those unclean people. I mean, she wouldn't want to show her face in town. You realize she's all alone, she's all by herself. Nobody wants to have fellowship with her. Nobody wants to talk to her. Nobody wants to have a meal with her. She doesn't have the love of a good man. She doesn't have the touch of children or grandchildren. I'm telling you that because of her disease, she was all by herself, alienated, isolated, and known. If she dared step out, they would literally go by her house and go, man, walk on the other side of the street. You know who lives there. I mean, that's a real personal thing, but it's a private thing. Can I say this to you, that even as Christians, sometimes things have happened in your life that are personal and they're private, and they're not for everybody to know. But you live in a day and time where getting into everybody else's business has become a pastime. And now you think because of that, and you find out some little tidbit about somebody, and you label them, and that label stays with them oftentimes for far too long, if not even the rest of their life. Because you feel like, oh, well, I just thought it was my place to let them know. Oh, you know, she's been to jail before. No, I didn't know that, and I don't appreciate you telling me that. And why did you tell me that? Well, I just felt like you needed to know. Why? She's not my wife. I didn't need to know that unless it's some kind of crime that's going to create some problem for a child or something like that. That's a whole different matter. But why is it we're so interested in trafficking and people's past foolishness? I don't understand. You know what it does? I just say this quickly and I'm going to move on really fast. Don't throw rocks at me. That's sometimes why people don't come to our churches because they hear you sitting at the dinner table talking about each other and they're like, if I go there, they're going to talk about me. I was at a place one time. We have uh, seafood where I'm at. We live kind of close to the beach there. It's pretty good seafood. And we were over to this place and we're sitting down. A bunch of church people after church, you know, they're coming from all the churches that are around us. We got everything you can possibly imagine in that place over there. And I'm walking around there and we get ready. We sit down. And there's two old blue haired, uh, pardon me, two elderly ladies sitting over here. Uh, and, and these old biddies are sitting over there and they're talking. And I mean, they are going to town about everybody in the church and about the preacher and uh, this and that and the other and so on and so on for. That's the closest I ever came. I, my wife kept sort of touching me on the back. She said, calm down now. Calm down now. I mean, I'm getting madder by the minute. I'm thinking, you know what? You Biddy Hugh. <laughs> Why would you keep doing that? And they're just talking. Just blah, 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 blah. It sounded like two, two blue jays fighting over a worm or something, man. And both of them talking and louder and louder and louder it goes and that kind of a thing. And that's the closest as I ever came. And I'm getting up saying, hey, what church do you go to? Oh, oh, we go to such and such a church. Good, I'll never come there. <laughs> but I thought to myself, you know what it is? That lady's in that situation. She's afraid to come outside because everybody knows her by what she is. Her personal life has now been strewn all over the entire town. Everybody knows it. But somebody, I don't know who it was, somebody said to her, hey, there's a great physician coming to town. She goes, don't matter, I ain't got no money. She's Southern. She don't matter, I ain't got no money. I can't do nothing, I can't pay anybody. I've already paid, I've already seen. That's why it's in the text. I've already paid all the physicians and I'm done better, I'm worse. There's nothing I can do. Don't matter, he don't charge anything. All you got to do is come to him, just show him that you're interested. She goes, yeah, but I can't go out in the crowd. I mean, between me, I know I'm the person with the problem and he has the provision, but man, there's people between me and him. The Bible says she couldn't get there for the press. That's not CNN and Fox and all the other kind of stuff like that. You know, got to be fair and balanced and all that kind of a deal. It's not whatever your news agencies are here and that kind of a deal. That's people. Sometimes people get between the people that need the help and the one trying to provide the help. They get between them. 
And that woman comes up there and she's sitting there thinking, if I could paint, I'd have her over there. She's anemic, man. She's had it now for 12 years. She's probably sitting over in a corner by the window over there and she's got knitting maybe. She's making an afghan or something. And she's just rocking back and forth in that rocking chair and looking out the window and watch the days come and watch the days go and watch the days come and watch the days go. And she goes about her business and all she's doing is existing. I mean, she's got a problem. And what's she going to do? Who's she going to relate to? Nobody else has the same problem. They can't have a class together. They can't sit down together. There's no telephone back then. There's no internet back then. There's no texting or nothing like that. It's just her in silence. Just sitting there, rocking back and forth. Another stitch, another stitch, not that one off. And another stitch, and another stitch, not that one off. And she's making an afghan for somebody, but who's going to want it? Because it's been touched by an unclean woman. And then she begins to think to herself, she said, well, if he's coming into town today, I guess if I don't do something, I'm going to die. You ever felt that way? You ever been bleeding to death and hemorrhaging so bad and you're so, uh, uh, you know, you have good curb appeal on the outside. Where I'm from in the south, you know, you walk up to somebody and their life is a shambles and it's falling apart. You know what you say? You say, how are you doing? You know what they say? Invariably, every time, you know what they say? Fine. Fine. I think you should put on their tombstone. Finally, fine. <laughs> That's all they say. Fine. How are you? Fine. Fine. I'm fine. If you ask them a second time, they'll say, fine. That means if you ask me again, I'm going to put an eye, a, a, a fork in your eye. That's how Southerners are. Fine means leave me alone. Right? It ain't, you know, oh, I'm really fine. Oh, well, praise the Lord. You know, I didn't mean I was that fine, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> Then they get up to you and say, oh, well, you said you were fine. You know I, what I meant by that. <laughs> then come up there, you know what she thinks to herself? She says, I'm going to bleed to death, kind of like some of you. You're hemorrhaging. Your life's blood's coming out of you. You're spiritually drained and dehydrated. You've had about all you can take. You've thought about things you never thought about, thought about doing things you never thought about doing. Life's worn you down. You just can't seem to get up above the water to get a breath. You figure, you know what? I'm just done. Just forget it. How are you? Fine. Just fine. And she says, you know something? If I don't do something quick, I'm going to die. She begins to get up and those old bones begin to creak and stuff and her joints begin to ache from a lack of blood supply and stuff and her organs are beginning to shut down from a lack of blood supply and, and she's thinking, man, I'm so weak. I tremble when I shake, man. My appetite's gone. Life doesn't even, food doesn't taste good. I have nothing to look forward to. I guess what I'll do is I think I'll, I think I'll head down there to him, but I guess if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I... If I could, maybe if I could do that, a little bit of glimmer of hope there, just for a moment. If I could get, she recognizes who he is, because if I can touch the hem of his garment, maybe he could help me. But you know what? Between her and him is a great distance. It's almost like a great gulf fixed. She has to overcome what everybody else thinks about her. That's a difficult thing. I was at a meeting one time in Alabama, and uh, there's a fellow sitting on the front row. Big church there, four sets of pews over this way like that, and come down the side over there in the south. You come, hey, how you? Fine, how you? How's the crops? Finally good. Ain't got a good stand of corn or nothing like that. The beans is coming up, though. And, but we ain't had quite enough rain. You know how that is over there. Them, them peanuts, they, they under the ground. They ain't doing no good. And the taters, the taters ain't come up yet. But, but overall, we're doing all right. Th thank, thank you. I wasn't wanting a full course meal. I was just, you know, <laughs> making conversation. You know, like, yeah, we done put chicken manure out there. You know, but it got a little hot out there. Burnt them tomatoes slap up. You know, we should have used cow manure. And I thank you. I don't need a horticulture class. I just trying to, you know, move on and all that. Well, now, but you come on out there now. We'll give you some. We'll, we'll feed you up. You know, and I, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. You know, and I'm coming across there, and we get there, and the preacher there, he uh, looks down there, and here's a guy. He's got a pretty rough life. You can tell, man. I mean, he's tatted up from one end to the other. He's got full sleeves and that kind of thing. He tries to cover him up with a shirt. You can see the tats through there and stuff like that. And you can tell, boy, sin with his rough shod hoofs are just stomped all over his face and stuff. Little boy sitting there next to him, about nine years old. And I walked up to him and I nodded my head like that. And he nodded back and kind of gave me the, you know, the once over. And the preacher says, ain't this something, man, the cop and the con. 
I could have shot that guy, man. The preacher, not him. And he goes, huh, ain't that something? This is our resident drug addict. He's a policeman. And the guy said, oh, hello, sir, it's nice to meet you. Man, I've never been so embarrassed in my life, man. I mean, I'm, I'm, people are sitting there, all of a sudden they're talking, all of a sudden they turn around, they're looking right at this guy, boy. And so I just knelt down there right there beside him, and I, the preacher walked off somewhere, and I said, man, I am sorry about that. I, 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 I'm embarrassed. He says, oh, preacher. He says, don't worry about that. And I said, well, can I ask you a couple of questions? And I, he said, sure. I said, uh, how long have you been out? And he said, oh, I've been out for years, about 15 now, I reckon. And I said, well, how long have you been clean? He said, 10 years. I said, you've been clean 10 years? He said, yes, sir. He said, but you know these folks around here, preacher, all they know you is for what you used to be. I said, you mean to tell me, this? I said, who is this right here? He said, this is my boy. That's how they talk in the South. It ain't, this is my son. It's not, I said, this is my boy. This is my boy. I said, this is your boy. I said, how old is he? He said, nine years old. I said, you mean to tell me he didn't? He said, no, sir. He didn't know nothing about what I used to be. He said, if these people around here hush up about it, he'd never know nothing about it. He said, I'm not that person anymore. I thought to myself, if I've ever wanted to put a scope on my Bible and shoot at a preacher, man, I wanted to do it that night, and I wanted to take out a stinking Gatlin gun and shoot at all the Christians in there. I'm not talking about literally now. <laughs> Where's Brother Josh? Keep your seat. Relax, okay? <laughs> Relax. To take it easy back there behind the board. All of a sudden, he's up over the board going, you know, just chill out, man. And, and so I, I'm, going up, I'm thinking to myself, what's this woman going to do? She's thinking to herself, man, if I go out there, those people will never even get close to them. You know how people are. They're, they're good people, but they don't want you to get close to Jesus. They sure will get close to him. You remember Bartimaeus over there? I like Bartimaeus. He's in Mark chapter number 10. Bartimaeus is over there, and the Bible says he's blind. And he's over there, you know, and, and the Lord calls him out there, and he says, oh, Lord, say, Lord, help me, Lord, help me, Lord, help me. And the people are saying, shut up, man, shut up. He don't help people like you. Leave him alone. He only helps good people, posh people like us, man. Hush up, man. You're not religious. You ain't even been to church. You just come to church and beg. Uh, go on now, man. Don't be embarrassing us like that. This is Jesus, man. Don't, don't be doing that. And the Lord makes the people bring him. I like that. Y'all escort him over here to me. And the Lord escorts him over there. Ask one of the strangest questions I ever heard in my life. You know what he says to him? He looks at Bartimaeus there and he said, What would thou do for thee? Well, Lord, it's kind of in the name. What is his name? Blind Bartimaeus. But you see, it's not that the Lord doesn't know what you need. It's do you know what you need? He said, Lord, my peepers, can you fix them? That woman sitting there to herself, and she begins to stop rocking, and she gets up there, and that rocking chair creaks and moans, and she looks over to the side there, and she picks up her robe or her hoodie, and she gets ready to go out the door, and she thinks, well, you know what? If I don't get to him now, there's not going to be any much hope for me. I'll be dead before long. I guess I'll, I guess I'll give it one more try. And she starts out that doorway, probably has one of them old screen doors on there with those long springs on them from Alabama, Tennessee. You know what that is. I just rang your bell, man. <laughs> that door goes. Rrrr! And when you're little, you can't wait. You stretch that spring as far as it'll go, and then you turn it loose, and then it cut. You know, it goes off. And then Paul Paul hollers, boy, if you do that again, you know, and you're cutting out across the cornfield, man. I mean, it's kind of like, and I think she opens that thing, and she, all of a sudden it starts to go, and she reaches over to grab that thing. She's thinking, man, if that door goes off, then these people are going to know I'm headed out. And down that pathway she begins to go, maybe remembers when she was a little girl, she walked down there and she'd say, oh, man, I used to go over here to the meat market, and I used to go over here to the five and dime and get me some candy, and I used to go by there and they'd make me some biscuits. And I go over here and they make me some pasta and make sure I get some tiramisu and get me filled up there. Sorry, I just had to throw that in there. <laughs> and and uh, make sure I got some sweets and stuff. And she begins to go through there and she's watching the crowd going by. And she's thinking, maybe I could intersect him about here. And she starts over in that direction. Nobody's recognizing her. They're enamored. Jesus is walking by. And she gets up in that crowd and she's now getting close. Now this is how I do it. I think all of a sudden the Lord recognizes 
that she's on the way. And, you know, he's been walking at a pretty good pace. And then all of a sudden he realizes she's going to have to take a little time to catch up. So I think the Lord all of a sudden he's kind of just sort of slowing down. You ever had the Lord just wait on you? Just wait. You say, well, he wants to hear from you. He makes it easy for you. Now, the Bible says that all of a sudden she gets out there and she's reaching. If I could get her, I'd have her just weak and completely exhausted and to the end of herself exasperated. And she's reaching out there and maybe somebody steps on her and she's trying to get to Jesus and they want to talk about politics. You know, sometimes people come to our churches in the States, probably not here, and they're really looking for Jesus. And they want to know whether or not they're a Democrat or a Republican or whether or not they're a Tea Party and who they're going to vote for for whatever's running on. They're just trying to get to Jesus and they want to talk about politics. Maybe they reach, she reaches out there and it's prejudice. Y'all probably don't have that problem here. I'm from the South. In the United States, certain people think they're better than certain people because of skin color. Again, y'all probably don't have that problem here. Y'all probably don't have to worry about that at all. I preached, I, I'm not saying this the wrong way. I preached in places where apartheid was there because there's one group of people think they're better than somebody else. And so all of a sudden they come in and say, oh, well, you know, what's your upbringing and where did you come from and what's your heritage? And, you know, we got to check and see what tone you are. Is this too real for you? Look like, do y'all not talk about that here? Y'all like, oh, we don't, we don't discuss, we don't discuss that here. Oh, good, I'm glad, I'm glad y'all aren't that way. But sometimes prejudice gets in the way. Yes, you know what happens? Sometimes people are trying to get to Jesus. Preferences get in the way. Yes, they walk in, they're not just looking just like us. They're different. They come from a different part of the world. They eat different food. They talk different. You can take a nap. Go ahead. You've been working hard all week. <laughs> Go ahead and zonk out. I don't blame you at all. You just look like a lion. When you did like that, it just kind of scared me a little bit. I, but, 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 but listen to me. Sometimes when people are trying to get to Jesus, you know what happened? All of a sudden, our preferential treatment comes in. Oh, I don't know. Would you fit in here? Oh, what do you do for a living? Where'd you come from? All of a sudden, we ask them for everything, but their social security number. They haven't even got, you know what they are? They're just looking for Jesus. But we got to, you know, we got to check you out first. You know, you fill out this questionnaire and then we'll run a background on you. And, and then after we do all that kind of, hey, we're just trying to get to Jesus. They want, you got trouble. Right. You got problems. I've been in the ERs at nighttime when people come in with everything from gunshots to car accidents and knife wounds and flus and vomiting and high fevers and things like that. And they don't stand up there and go, no, we don't really listen. We, the vomiters go down there and the flus go down over there and uh, gunshots, uh, not to the head. We'll take anything from the lower extremities. If, you, if it's the leg or something, we're good. But yeah, no, uh, head wounds down there. No, in a hospital when people... People come, listen to me. Here's what they do. They walk in and say, I need some help. Have you got insurance? No, they triage them first. They help them. Oh, look, I understand the system, but the hospital oftentimes is a great illustration of what the church, people are just looking for Jesus. You know, hey, you saved? I don't even know what that means. Could I just come to church and see Jesus? Well, who are you going to sit with? You say, why? Because sometimes clicks get in the way. We got mean girls. Oh, no, he didn't. We got people that, unless you're a certain group or certain category, are you, you follow me? I don't need to give you ten more illustrations, right? You're like, we got it, move on, move on. Okay, you're like the policeman, you know, straight ahead, two blocks, turn right, two blocks, turn right. How do you get to wherever you're going? Two blocks and turn right. That's the direction for everybody to go. And so here's what I want you to understand. There's something that has prevented her for years, but she is now desperate enough to recognize if I don't get to him and he doesn't help me, I'm going to die. And sometimes spiritually we need to get back to that desperate I got to get some help. I am hurting. I'm bleeding to death. You go to bed with it, you dream about it, and you wake up with it. And it drains you dry. And whereas the joy of the Lord should be our strength, 
The devil sees to it that he crushes our joy oftentimes using people and their issues to keep us from bringing our issues to the great position. And she stretches out. And she touches the hem of his garment. I mean, just enough. Just a couple of fingers. Just, and just like that, man, she feels like a little kid again. I mean, man, that issue of blood is staunched. It's stopped. All of a sudden, her energy returns. Her strength returns. She feels like a young girl again, man. I'm talking about instantaneously, just like salvation, just like that takes place. But here's the odd thing in the passage that's amazing to me. The Lord says, who touched me? And there's a bunch of Bible believers that are there. They're the apostles. They've been in Bible school. They've been with the Lord now for a long enough period of time. They're like, Lord, we're glad you finally asked us a question. Uh, we're, we're glad to assist you with that because we know the Bible. Rightly divided, of course. Uh, we know all the books in the Bible, Genesis to Revelation. We can quote those books to you. Oh, Lord, what was the question again? Who touched me? And they're like, now, Lord, let us just give you a little bit of advice, okay? Uh, everybody's touching you. I mean, they're taking selfies and duck lips and all this kind of stuff, you know. And, and, and Lord, all, I mean, all these people touched you. The Lord had to scratch his head and go, you guys still don't get it. When I say touched me, I mean touched me with the feelings of their infirmities. I mean brought a real problem to me, not just a photo op. Not just there to show up to be seen, but show up because they're willing to say, help me. Can you understand this is a woman in Jewish culture? Now you know what I see nowadays? I see grown men that are ashamed to come down to an altar because they're afraid they're embarrassed to be seen coming to Jesus at an altar like we talked about last night. Because why? And here's a woman in Jewish culture and she's like, I could care less. I'm dying. I need some help. I'm desperate. And the Lord says, who touched me now? Here's how I draw it. I think all of a sudden he touched her and he's like, that a girl. You did not let them or your disease keep you from me. That a girl. And he turns around and I think he's looking right at her and he goes, who touched me? And she's thinking, oh man, he's got me. Oh man, is he going to take this away? What's going to happen? And, and, and all of a sudden she, she it, it was it was me. Oh, this just warms my soul. He doesn't say woman. He doesn't say girl. You know what he says? Daughter. You know why? He just brushed back the whole crowd. That's my daughter. You better keep your paws off of her. Because nobody said anything. Daughter. Thy faith hath made thee whole. As soon as she touched, they're like, Oh, that's that woman. Oh, oh, uh-uh. She is unclean. Now he is un Oh, that daughter. Don't you worry about these people. I got you. I got you. You know what I think? I think when the Lord comes into the triumphal entry... I think when he comes in there, I think she's in the crowd. And I think she's rejoicing. I think she's taken a robe and thrown it down there on the ground. I think she's been over there with a machete cutting down palm leaves and throwing down things like that. And I think she's singing Hosanna and praise the Lord. And she's saying, Lord, look, I can put ten tree leaves out there. I mean, look how strong I am, Lord. I'm feeling really good, man. I feel like I'm going to do aerobics, man. I mean, I'm going to run a marathon. Man, Lord, and you know what the Pharisees say? Would you tell her to shut up? And the Lord's like, are you serious? Do you know how sick she was? Do you know she was bleeding to death? Do you know she was hemorrhaging? Do you have any idea what I did for her? If I shut up, the very rocks she's standing on are going to be crying out because I did something for her. I think she's right there. You know what I think she's saying? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And people are like, why are you thanking the Lord? Oh, I'm thanking the Lord because He healed me. No, she's thinking, man, I thank the Lord for 12 years. I was sick. 
and he kept me alive long enough for him to come by my way. And if I wasn't sick, I wouldn't have been seeking him. I would have never found him. And as a result of my sickness, he did something for me that Ajax won't take off. <coughs> Cleaner, cleanser, bleach. <laughs> I think she's glad now and understands her sickness was for God's glory. You know where we are? We're in 2023. That's been over 2,000 years ago. Guess what we're talking about tonight? A woman with an issue that was hemorrhaging and would have died without Jesus. And we're ringing her bell in glory right now. Jesus is up there on the throne. This is how I paint it anyway. And he calls her by name. What's her name? A woman with an issue. He knows her name. He said, come here. Yes, sir, Lord. How are you today? Boy, it sure is good to see you. Boy, I sure am glad the Lord said, hold on, just hang on a minute. <laughs> They're telling your story. Of all the stories I could have pinned in the Bible by the power of the Holy Spirit, I pinned your story in there. And the Lord, she says, you know, Lord, I sure am glad I remain nameless. I just sure am glad I got a chance to talk to you. I'm glad my name is now written in glory. Lord, this is good. He said, listen to this boy tell your story. Well, Lord, he's kind of telling it a little bit different all that. Well, don't pay no attention. He's from the South. He's doing the best that he can. <laughs> She said, yeah, but I think I could, well, women can't preach, so you just let him tell your story. It'll be all right. And she said, Lord, I sure am glad that you could take my tragedy and turn it into a triumph. I sure am glad for your glory that you allowed me to be sick and allowed me to suffer just so you could get some glory. Lord, I'm grateful in eternity and I sure am glad they're telling the story. Right now, we're telling the story right now. We were in a prison one time. It been several years ago now. The old preacher was still alive. We were in a women's prison. <laughs> About 75 women in there. The terraza floor, that's like polished concrete. There was somebody had donated some old naugahyde pew. It's like a knockoff leather, kind of plasticky. Um, I don't know. It, it don't. It don't even look. I mean, it's supposed to look like leather. It doesn't look like leather. It looks like bad plastic. And these girls come in, man, and I mean, they are rough. And they're marching in, in their orange suits, and they got on their shower shoes, and most of their hair is all matted up like a junkyard dog up underneath a truck somewhere, and that kind of a thing, and they're sitting there and skin poppers on them and old meth teeth, you know, burn out black popcorn in their, in their mouths and stuff like that. And breath just blister the paint off the wall, man. They're detoxing. They're sweating and just, just, just goo coming out of them. Just. And the preacher gets up there and he starts drawing Jesus in the middle here and on Calvary and has the two thieves on either side of the man in the middle, you know, and he's drawing that kind of thing. And he said, boy, this... Ladies, have you ever had a man love you? This man will really love you and he'll take care of you and he'll watch over you. He's bragging on Jesus. There's a black girl in there and she said, Ooh, Lord, I'd like to meet him. And the preacher turned around and he said, Just hang on a minute, I'm going to introduce you to him. She said, Please do, sir. And he goes back to drawing like that. She said, Man, what a man. And he said, Oh, you ain't heard half of it yet. You know, he kept on drawing. You get down to the end there, I'm standing all the way back in the back. There's nowhere to, to, to sit down. It's just too crowded in there. I'm all the way in the back against the door, and there's a pew literally right here. And I'm watching this little girl there. She's got her eyes. She is transfixed by him drawing. And I mean tears are crashing down her cheeks, man. And they splash off of her chin, and they drop down and just hit the edge of that little naugahyde pew and then splash down onto the floor, man. Just little droplets just splashing like that, splattering. And gets ready to give the invitation and that little old girl's bottom lip. You know how the little babies will cry and that bottom lip will, you know, it's so pitiful, man. It's terrible. And the little old lips quiver and I'm like, she's going to get saved, man. This is going to be good, boy. She's going to get saved. And, and she sits there and sits there and he prays and tries to help them to understand about how to trust Jesus Christ. And we get done with that thing and said, okay, any of you ever trust Jesus Christ for the first time? And several ladies gave a testimony and she didn't do anything. And I thought, well... Maybe she's saved and just got cattywampus or something. I don't know, you know. And so I thought, well, okay, I, I guess, man. But, boy, I sure thought she was going to get in. And I was rolling up the picture on the floor and 
getting things ready to go and I felt a shadow kind of come over the top. They have fluorescent lights similar to these and kind of cold in there and I felt a shadow come up over the top of me and she's standing there and she said, don't, 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 don't hurt him. And I said, oh, ma'am, I said, he's not here anymore. He's up in heaven. He ever liveth to make intercession for you. She looked at me like I was crazy. She didn't understand what I said. She didn't know the, the passage. And I said, uh, I said, he's up there in heaven. She said, well, he couldn't clean me up. And I said, ma'am, the Bible says, come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as wool. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as snow. And she said, I don't care what it says. He can't clean me. I said, sister, if he can't clean you, he can't clean me. She said, you don't know what I did. I said, I don't need to know what you did. She said, I've done some bad things. I looked over at the chaplain, old chaplain Westmoreland. She'd been going there for 30 years or so, volunteer chaplain, good woman. And I said, chaplain, I think she might like to talk to you. And they sat down on the front pew over here, and they're talking back and forth. And about the time they're getting ready to discuss things there, eventually she just slid off the edge of that pew, and chaplain Westmoreland got down the more arthritic knees and stuff and got down there and started praying, and the correction officer came in the back hollered count and called the girl by name and so on and so forth and she gets up and she's wiping her cheeks and wiping her cheeks you know and stuff like that and, and she's uh, bawling and crying and squalling and she said I gotta go and the chaplain says I got her I'll bring her no sir chaplain she said no ma'am chaplain I'm sorry but I know she knows what she's doing I know her name I know what she's trying to do she's up to no good no ma'am you know she said I can bring her she said no ma'am you have her come right now so she walked out this way and she's walking and I'm standing right here the preacher and getting chalk and all that stuff getting ready to go She's walking down the side. I can see her. And I looked at her and I said, hey, can I ask you a question? She said, I have to go. I'm sorry. I said, can I ask you just a quick question? Just quick, you, can ask, you can answer while you're walking. I got to go. I got to go. I said, I just want to ask you a question. <laughs> Did you get things fixed? I could pick her out of a lineup today, and that's been years ago. The preacher's been gone now seven years, I guess, this past year. So it had to have been at least maybe ten years ago. I could pick her out. I'm sure she's changed by now. She got right back to the corner, getting ready to turn toward the door. You know what she did? She turned around and she looked at me. She said, I'm clean now. She still had on the same orange jumpsuit. Sweat stains under her arms. Still had the skin poppers and still had the old burnt popcorn teeth. I'm clean now. You say, why? She met the great physician. She got help. We came back a year later into that same uh, prison, that same jail, and a chapel in Westmore. And I said, chaplain, I said, you remember that girl you led to the Lord there at the front of that meeting? And she goes, yeah, I remember. And I thought, oh, man, I'm sorry. I have a tendency to be a little negative. And I said, well, what did she do? She goes, oh, no, it's not bad. She said what that girl did was is she'd go back to their dorms. That's what they call them there in that place, to her pods. And she said, we give them out these little uh, uh, bookmarks and these little uh, uh, comic books of uh, scripture and stuff. And she said, but they have to memorize scripture to be able to do it, to be able to get it. And she was in a pod there with a whole bunch of girls that can't read. So she would say, you know, well, if you want one of those things, I'll memorize the scripture. I'll say it for you. I'll get the gift and give it to you. She said, everybody in her pod that couldn't read, she memorized verses. And when she quoted those verses, they'd give her this stuff and she'd walk over to them and hand it to them. She said, everybody in her pod, she memorized scripture so that she could give them something. She said, yeah, I think she really changed. <laughs> you say, oh, preacher, that's just one of them old tear-jerking stories. Sure it is. It's real life. She had enough sense to say, I'm bleeding to death. Now I want to ask you a question. I'm not even going to get to Jerry's his daughter. I'll give you the end of the story, okay? She died. Spoiler alert. And then Jesus resurrected her. <clears throat> but I'm going to ask you a question. If you ever find yourself in a situation like this woman of no name, hemorrhage into death, good curb appeal but messed up on the inside, looking pretty good on the outside, have you ever tried coming to Jesus? You know why you're reading about her? Because she got up and asked Jesus to help her. Why didn't Jesus make the house call? Because he wants to know whether or not you're sick enough to say, Lord, if you don't help me, the Lord said, okay, come unto me. All you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my yoke is easy, and my burden's light. 
but you have to be willing to come. Lord, I'm hemorrhaging. Lord, I'm bleeding. Lord, I got a problem. Nobody else knows. I put on a good front. But if I don't get some help, I'm going to hemorrhage to death. Heavenly Father, I'd ask now that you might help us as we consider these matters. We thank you for these great stories that are in the Bible that help us to recognize that the, we're not beyond the same problems that they had way back in the day when you were around on the face of the earth. And Lord, you're still available. And the Bible teaches us that we have a refuge that we can run to, and that refuge is you, a person, an individual, not a place. And we'd ask, Lord, now maybe you might help somebody here. Many tears have flowed during the time. Many thoughts have happened. And I'd ask, Lord, that you'll not let the people get between you and us so that we can get the provision that you're willing to give us if we're willing to ask. And pray, Heavenly Father, you might help us even this evening. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.